Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick Game Theatrecom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with good news, he says sarcastically, because silicon wafer manufacturers are planning to increase prices by 20%. So that means that CPUs, GPUs, and other components are going to raise in price in kind. Then we're going to move over to AMD, because a new next generation GPU architecture is being hinted and this is not based upon GCN and instead will be its successor and then we're going to finish the video with Dell and Epic which of course is AMD's range of server based processors because the company AMD have shared benchmarks which puts the new processors in very good light and that uh, news article is a submission from a viewer uh, by the name of Joe. But we're going to start things out with the good news, he says, through gritted teeth and clenched fists. We all know that recently in technology, memory prices have been absolutely ballistic, and there are some reasons behind that which are, well, kind of deliberate. At the beginning, at least, manufacturers of memory weren't um, operating to capacity. In other words, they were not producing as many chips as perhaps what they could have, but now it's kind of like a runaway effect because obviously DRAM is being found in pretty much every computer device. It's kind of, well, critical. It's you know, a component you can't really do without. SSDs are becoming more plentiful. So that's another uh, issue with silicon and the general production of these type of chips. Then, of course, you've got mobile phones, graphics cards with the mining situation, the PlayStation 4, the Xbox One. You get the idea. So, back in November of this year, a Japanese company by the name of Sumco have told us that they were planning to increase prices by 20% this year, and then there would be a secondary price increase which would take place next year, which of course is 2019. The problem is, other companies are now joining in on the fray, which is not too surprising, and this includes Global Wafers, and they will also be increasing prices by 20% as well. And don't forget, Sumco are not a small fish in this. They produce about 60%, slightly over actually, of the world's silicon wafer supply. So that means that any components which require silicon wafers, hint, pretty much everything that is critical once again to a computer, so for example CPUs, GPUs, DRAM, Flash, and obviously this is also going to uh, affect AMD, it's going to affect Intel, and so on. So the chairwoman, Doris Hsu, of Global Wafers has also confirmed that the company would be rising prices as well. And one of the biggest reasons behind this, and I'm sure you're probably going to believe this and be quite smiling, um, is that there is a shortage of 12-inch 300mm wafers. And these are the components which are traditionally used to create processors and GPUs. So now we're in this perfect storm of GPU prices. And it's rare that I tell you to do this, but honestly, I'd almost be tempted to look at companies like Dell, like, um, well, HP or any company really, and actually consider buying a pre-made computer. Because oftentimes it's cheaper, because the GPU prices alone of like the 1080s is ridiculous. The 1080 Ti is the same thing. Vega, forget it. Even a Polaris-based GPU like the 500 series, they're really expensive. And sometimes you can get lucky. Some companies are allowing you to buy one GPU, particularly with other components. For example, if you were to buy, I don't know, let's say an SSD and let's say a i7 processor, then they may sell you the GPU with the RRP or MSRP. But a lot of companies are not doing that and still there are shortages. And honestly, even RAM now, I mean, RAM prices have gone up, as everyone knows, quite a bit. So one of the benefits of buying a pre-made system, and once again I'm saying this through gritted teeth some, is that you do sometimes get better deals. And if you buy one from a reasonable company, um, then, you know, you've got reasonable parts in there, but do make sure that you kind of double-check that, make sure that the components... Uh, offer great upgradability if you do go down this route and I'm not suggesting it is a certainty I'm simply saying that well this is going to continue I don't think prices are going to be any lower and it's kind of weird because I wouldn't I almost suspect that the PlayStation 4 the Xbox one even the switch probably is also feeling this as well I wouldn't have been surprised if 
in an alternative universe if prices have become lower, if we would have actually seen the Xbox One X maybe even launch at cheaper than when it did. So it's, once again, it's just a perfect storm, and while it is certainly impacting PC gamers and laptops, well, it's also affecting smartphone prices and pretty much the entire gamut of technology. So, that sucks. There's another article that's doing the round, and I'm getting this from WCCF Tech, and because they are citing their own sources. Obviously, I cannot um, tell you whether this is true or not, but what they are citing is that there is a new microarchitecture which is going to be succeeding Navi. We've confirmed that already. I mean, well, not we, as in, you know, it's commonly known. AMD have told us this uh, in slides and uh, roadmaps. And they've basically said that the next generation is going to be built on 7NM+. Plus. So, for those of you who have been somewhat lost in the AMD soup of graphics cards, and I kind of don't blame you because it's getting a little complex at the moment, you've had Vega, which was... Semi Raja Kodori, who got involved in the project, but honestly, the initial design had pretty much been completed by the time he um, kind of stepped up to the mantle, if you will, if you excuse the pun of AMD mantle. Haha. <laughs> and then uh, there was supposed to be Navi, but Vega now is going to be refreshed, so we're going to get a 7nm Vega. Vega currently, of course, is built on 14nm, so if you were to buy like a Vega 56 or a 64 or even one of the professional GPU market ones, they would be built on a 14nm process. They're going to refresh this. Uh, apparently, that's going to happen this year for prosumers, so in other words, server markets and artificial intelligence type of usage, deep learning, you get the idea. And that will be built on 7nm. After that, there will be Navi. Navi is going to also be built on 7nm. So what they're actually doing here is using Vega as kind of like um, a proof of concept. Because it's a lot harder to produce a new architecture and also shrink that architecture down to a smaller process. Whereas if you're only doing one, it basically increases the likelihood of actually good yields. Plus, of course, it makes it easier and it also smooths over the transition. And we all know that Vega is a good architecture in theory, it just has some problems, primarily heat. So shrinking it down should, in theory, reduce the power consumption and should, in theory, reduce heat output. And should, in theory, yeah, you're probably getting me sick of me saying that, but obviously all of this is theory, also allow additional uh, GPU shaders and other components on the actual GPU. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see the uh, GPU become more efficient and more powerful. Whether we're going to see a gaming orientated version of that, we don't know. After that, once again, it's going to be Navi. We don't know too much about that. It's got next generation memory, which, let's face it, it's probably GDDR6 or HBM3. It's supposed to be scalable, whatever that means, but it's most likely going to be based upon um, their, you know, their Lego philosophy over at AMD. And then we're going to see next generation. So... Navi is still going to be based upon GCN. I'm assuming it's going to be an evolved version of GCN, so I'm assuming they're going to take what works with Vega and probably tweak it, and therefore we're going to get Navi. Don't forget, Vega itself was also tweaked considerably from Polaris, but the problem with Vega is some of the technology just wasn't working quite, quite correctly. For example, the primitive discard um, and other... Uh, Wait, did I say primitive discard? I meant to say primitive shader, excuse me. And other technology like HBCC, it, it just wasn't working quite as advertised. So hopefully this will be resolved with 7nm. Navi will improve efficiency and performance perhaps even further. This might actually be a little bit like, let's say, Maxwell to, say, Volta. Obviously I'm using NVIDIA terminology here. And next generation is not going to be based on GCN whatsoever. Now the important thing here is it's going to be released in the time frame of 2020 to 2021 and it will be of course executed with a new RTG leadership so in other words this will be the successor of Raj Akhadori who will be spearheading this so the last piece of today's history lesson is GCN itself was first introduced back in 2011 and that architecture was based on um, sorry codenamed Southern Islands now it replaced the Terrascale microarchitecture and in the actual design phase it was considerably different to the previous generation so with Terrascale it was very long instruction word and then it was changed to RISC reduced instruction set based computing the purpose here is that AMD were shifting towards a more compute orientated focus now from what these rumors are 
the new macro architecture will have a similar, perhaps even a greater performance differential between the older architecture of um, Terrascal to GCN, and they're saying that GCN to this new architecture is going to be an even greater difference. From what you can probably ascertain from just what they're saying here, it's almost going to be like the bulldozer to Zen kind of philosophy, where you know they had mul multiple um, different architectures based on bulldozer and excavator and all of that type of stuff, and then of course they simply redesigned and went back to a completely different approach with Zen. So perhaps. This new architecture, whatever you want to call it, is going to essentially be AMD's version of Zen. Then again, I am very curious to see what's going to happen in terms of Navi and what the performance is going to be. Speaking of Zen, Epic processors have done rather well in terms of their reception in the industry. And they, of course, will be found in uh, server racks, HPC type of uh, computing environments. One of the companies that have really embraced these are Dell, and they are launching a series of PowerEdge servers. And once again, one of the defining features here is the sheer number of Zen cores which, you can, be found, which can be found in these type of uh, racks. For example, the R6415 is specifically tuned for edge computing up to 32 high performance Zen cores, up to 2 terabytes of memory and 10 NVMe drives. And you've also got the 7415, no compromise, scale up efficiency for software defined storage, 32 high performance Zen cores, 2 terabytes of memory and up to 24 NVMe drives if you just need that that sheer abundance of storage and then you've got the r7425 which has up to 64 high performance zen cores that to put it into context is 128 threads if you count of course smt and up to four terabytes of memory capacity and of course this is due to the fact that you have a couple of sockets on the motherboard but perhaps more telling is AMD's own benchmarks. So there are a couple of things that we need to take into consideration here. One, Intel have released their own benchmarks. I'll get to those in a moment because it is worth talking about things from two perspective. The second is that these benchmarks were not factoring in Meltdown or Spectre patches. Now, Meltdown, before anyone types it in the comments, does not affect AMD, but Spectre kind of does. So the performance metrics will probably shift a little bit However, possibly actually in AMD's favor because once again, they're not affected by meltdown. So AMD are currently telling anyone who will listen, in other words, the press, that yes, they are still re-benchmarking all of this stuff. And what we're going to be looking at here are figures which are derived from Spec Crate 2017, 2017, excuse me, int rate tests. Uh, previously, there was 2006, the version which was used, and obviously now it's getting a little bit old, so they might as well update things. I won't read out all the figures because I'll be here for way too long, but you can see on screen the sheer value proposition that AMD are offering. They are basically um, telling us if we were to look at the two Epic 755s versus two Xeons uh, 5118s, that you're looking at a 31% improvement in uh, price slash performance. And of course, they will also point out their IO connectivity and other shyness. When it comes to two Epics versus two Xeons, then you've got the Epic 7601, which is going to cost you $4,200 compared to the Xeon setup, which is going to cost you $4,700. And obviously this scales as well. So if we go down the stack a little bit, for example, you can get the Epic 7301 versus the Xeon 4116, and that's going to cost you $825 versus $1,002 respectively. Perhaps one of my favorite slides, though, is the Epic powers the heart of the market. Epic provides more scale, expansion, and memory bandwidth. Number of cores, 16, and then they've got, uh, this is 7301 compared to the Xeon 4116, and they've said more. However, the one of the only notes they've not made, of course, is the boost frequency, which is 2.7 gigahertz versus 3 gigahertz, so about a 10% difference there. Cache, 64 megabytes versus 16.5 more. Memory channels, more, more memory channels, more maximum capacity, and more speed, more memory speed, damn it. So, it's quite amusing. However, there is a counter-argument to this, of course, because Intel are not just going to sit down and say, well, that's fine, you just, you know, release your benchmarks. Um, 
Intel released its own benchmarks, I believe, he says, double-checking his numbers. Yes, it was late last year, it was around November, December time. AMD actually uh, were fighting a a Intel's, um, and back in uh, the later part of last year, Intel did point out that AMD had not released many spec submissions. And in various benchmarks, were quick to point out that in a lot of tests, the Xeon setup, setups, excuse me, the Xeon Platinums, for example, the 8160s and the 8180s, in terms of single thread performance, they did do better than the Epic. And in a variety of different benchmarks, in two socket server benchmarks, we see once again the Xeon lineup. This includes the E5 2600 V4 Broadwell, as well as the scalable processor Skylake SP versus Epix 76. 01, and you can see that AMD do a fairly decent job to fight off Intel, but Intel do, in many applications, manage to pit them to the post. Now, if you're listening to all of this and thinking, well, what the hell does that really mean? Honestly, it's a good thing for everyone. AMD certainly are not winning in certain areas, and Intel have AVX512, which is probably going to become increasingly popular over the next several months, perhaps a couple of years, as... Uh, applications increasingly are utilize uh, are utilizing excuse me the instruction set but that's not necessarily the end of the story for AMD the fact is now they're actually on the roadmap and they can actually start to eat into the server market some which AMD have just been completely and utterly just shoved out of by Intel over the last several years I mean back in the day it's fair to say that Intel still had a fairly large monopoly in the market but at least AMD were there at least you could buy some Intel uh, sorry AMD servers but now like no one at least until recently was even offering them for uh, customers because they just weren't worth it in terms of performance so now obviously AMD are back in the game with all of that said hopefully you've enjoyed the video I'll see you soon take care bye for now